Hi folks, I'm Chelsea Troy, and today I am going to walk you through the state of the Rock compiler as of November of 2021. So I'll walk you through some of the files that we have in the compiler and so that you can understand the steps that the compiler takes right now and where those can be found in the code itself. Now, I want to say before I get started that this is probably not the best introduction to compilers as a whole. One of the things that we're going to talk about in this walkthrough is the way that the steps are laid out in the Rock compiler, and in particular, some of the ways that the Rock compiler diverges from some of the standard approaches that you may have read about in a book like The Dragon Book or Crafting Interpreters which lay out sort of standard compilation processes, which some of the choices in the Rock compiler diverges from. One of the main things that I suspect you'll take away from this video, if you've read a book like that about compilers, is the degree to which the order of the steps in the compilation process can depend on the language, and some of those choices can differ from language to language based on the trade-offs that those particular designers were evaluating at the time. So this walkthrough might be a good sort of second resource after you've read a first one on compilers, but it probably isn't a good introduction to compilers as a whole. Now, if you are new to compilers and you're interested in learning more, I've already mentioned a couple of books that you can look at. And I'm also going to link a couple of series that I have written on my blog. I'll link those in the description below so that you're able to find them. And they can give you some idea of the steps of the compilation process and what is happening when a compiler converts front-end source code to something that can run on a machine on the back end. With that having been said, let's go ahead and get started talking about Rock. So, Rock is a more or less purely functional programming language. And today we're going to be going through the original compiler, which we're working on now, written largely in Rust with some pieces in a programming language called Zig. We're going to walk through it from the front end, i.e. where the rock code lives in files, all the way through to the back end. That is, how do we end up executing these commands on a machine? So let me go ahead and switch over to a programming view so that you can see what I have. We're going to be looking at this in VS Code today, which is a new editor to me, so I'm not going to be great with the key bindings here. Um, okay. So hopefully you can see all of that. So I've got the rock repo open here, and what I'd like to do is sort of start from the very front end where you would be, let's say, developing a built-in all the way to the back end. So the first thing to know is that we have a couple of different kinds of tests in Rock, And those tests allow us at different levels to ascertain whether everything is working the way that it should. The first set of tests that I want to introduce you to are the ones in CLI run. So let me pull that up. Okay, so we have this file, CLI run. So these tests go to Valgrind and check that all of the memory gets freed when we are running rock code. Um, but these are also computationally expensive tests and they're kind of slow to run. So we tend to run these, we run these on CI when we're merging stuff in, but this is not the kind of thing that you want to be running from run to run because it does take a while. So we have a couple of other kinds of tests that I'd like to introduce you to in rock as well. Another one that we have can be exemplified in a file. Let's see if I can pull it up. REPL eval. Okay, so REPL eval. These are some additional tests that we have. Let's take a look at an example. So, for example, we have like this test, which is expecting this literal of 42 to succeed. So, these tests are a little bit different from the CLI run tests. These are still end-to-end -end tests, so they depend on our REPL. When you run these tests, you are also checking the rock REPL for now. 
However, they are less expensive to run than the CLI tests. They allow you to test one line of code at a time. So you'll notice that in these tests, for the most part, let me uh, scroll down actually so that you can see some more of these. We have like particular lines of code, right? And we're checking the results on those individual lines of code. Now, if you want to be checking more than one line of code at a time, that's where we want to go to test gen. So we have uh, this test gen. Oh, that's not, where am I trying to go? Test gen directory. So let's look at an example. Let's look at strings, right? Okay, so you can see over here on the left, I've got my test gen directory, right? And then inside of the source directory, I have these various tests for comparing, for dictionaries, for lists, numbers, primitives, records, result, etc. Now, if you happen to be building a built-in, you're likely to be able to put tests in one of these. For example, if you're building a built-in for numbers, this might be the place to put a test for your functionality that you are adding. So these take a source string and they convert it into a file for the compiler, but the compiler isn't going to the file system for anything when it's running these tests. So as a result, these tests do run faster. Um, that having been said, these tests do still run the actual code. And so you can think of these as end to end in the sense that we're starting with the front end code and then making sure that it runs all the way through. We also test individual pieces of the compilation process. So let me show you an example of that. We have, um, let's look for, yeah, so here we have solve expert. This is a REST file. And here we are, uh, we have our automated test for our type checking. We're going to talk a little bit about the solving step for type checking later, but in this file, we are testing like a particular portion of our compilation process as opposed to going from the front end all the way to the back end and evaluating the entire thing. So those are the four main kinds of tests that I want you to know about in Rock, and that's likely where you're going to start if you're trying to add built-ins or add functionality to Rock. You'll want to start with a test that makes sure that the given line or lines of code that you are trying to get to function return what you are expecting them to return after you have implemented them. And those are the kinds of tests where you will be able to delineate that prior to implementation. So those are the tests. Now let's talk a little bit through um, the front end all the way to the back end of Rock. This is where we start to see our first divergence from what you may understand as sort of the general order of things in a compiler. So the first step that a lot of introduction to compilers resources will discuss is the lexing step, where we take in the line of code character by character. Rock doesn't do a lexing step as such. Instead, it goes from raw characters to an abstract syntax tree with a parser combinator. Now, I don't want to get too in detail on parser combinators right now, but what you can, the way that you can think of this is as a set of functions that individually are capable of parsing different particular um, statements and expressions in the code. And you can pass these, um, you can pass these parsers to one another and combine them together to get the abstract syntax tree that you are expecting on the other end. Now, one thing to know about Rock is that we generate an abstract syntax tree both in the success case and in the error case as well. And what that does is it allows for a more precise and descriptive error message in the event that something is wrong at the parsing stage. Now, not all programming languages do that. Rust is another programming language that's like sort of headed in that direction. Um, but 
You won't see that with all programming languages in part because generally as folks are getting started with a programming language they run into a lot of those parser errors and then as they start to become comfortable with the syntax that doesn't end up being so much of an issue anymore. But having that abstract syntax tree for the error case we're hoping will make it easier for folks to get started with Rock. So we have these parser combinators. Let's talk a little bit through the parser. Now, one thing to know about Rock is that a Rock file has a couple of different pieces associated with it. Let me see if I can pull one out here to show you. I'm not going to be able to come up with a good example on the spot right here. But um, the way that a Rock file is constructed is that it's got headers and then it's got the body of the code itself. So those headers have their own sort of language that allows us to um, gather information about the file. You're going to see things in here like imports, the file name, um, and we want to be able to look these up. You can find the parsing logic for the headers in header.rn. Let me make sure that this is the right one. So it's this parse source one. So this is where we're parsing the header of a rock file. So that's the first part of the parsing. And like I said, that's kind of its own little language. After that, and separate from that, is the parsing for the code. So like I mentioned, rock builds an abstract syntax tree not only in success, but also in failure. And the idea there is to provide rich and useful feedback about what went wrong in parsing. Um, you can find that in, let's see if I can show that to you. Okay, so you can find starting points for that in this parser.rs file. Now let's see if I can show you at the parsing step where also uh, we've also got helpers for things like type annotations, strings, numbers, those kinds of things. You can see some more examples of that in this expert.rs file, which is in, um, in our constrained directory. I'll talk a little bit about our directory structure later, but the high level here is that the directory structure for the rock compiler right now doesn't always make semantic sense. And here's why. So when we're trying to rebuild the project in Rust, what will happen is that if we have changed a given module, that module needs to rebuild before we can end up running the updated project. And the project at this point is of a size where needing to rebuild the entire thing would take a significant amount of time. And so sometimes the files are located in places that quote unquote don't make semantic sense because they are located with other files that are likely to have to change at the same time as them. And so sometimes you will see a file located in a directory that names a different step of the compilation process than you're really on. And the reason is often that that file changes most often with files that are also in that directory, such that when several files in that directory change at once, that small portion of the code is the part that has to rebuild. Whereas if files were changing in directories all across the project, more modules would have to rebuild and it would take a longer time to update and be able to run the updated code. Okay, so that's sort of an introduction to the way that we do parsing in Rock. The next step we're going to find largely here, let me shut some of these. Okay. So the next step in the process for the rock compiler is called canonicalization. And so there are a number of different things that happen at the canonicalization step. For example, this is where we're determining whether names are in scope, whether modules are available. This is where we are validating a lot of the parser output, um, converting parser errors to error messages, and uh, sorting definitions in order to be able to make sure that 
the things that we are using at one step have already been defined before that point. Let me show you some of the input points for this. So the first thing to know is that there is this directory called can. And can is short for canonicalization. Let me show you an example of something that's in here. So let's pull up. Okay, so def.rs. This is in our can directory inside of the compiler. And like I said, can stands for canonicalization. So what we're doing here is sorting our definitions. Now, I mentioned we want to make sure that our definitions are sorted such that the ones that depend on different ones come after the ones that they depend on. And the sorting practice that we use for this is called the topological sort. So I don't want to get super deep into how topological sort works in this video, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to link a resource about topological sort in the description of this video. And you can think of topological sort as a procedure similar to the one that you go through uh, mentally when you are deciding what order to put your clothes on in in the morning. So you have to make sure that your underwear gets put on before your pants and you have to make sure that your t-shirt gets put on before your hoodie and so on and so forth. Very similar thing except for us with dependencies. Okay, so uh, a couple of other things happen at the canonicalization step. And once again here we have a departure from what you may have read about. So for example in the book Crafting Interpreters, one of the things that that book talks about in the example that it gives is the parser and in particular it defines precedence and associativity within the context of the parser. Precedence being which of these operations is supposed to happen first given that they're different operations and associativity meaning if you've got two of the same operation on the same line which of those is supposed to happen first. So rock determines the precedence of infix operators, that is, um, for example, binary operators that come in between two numbers or something like that. It uh, sorts out the precedence of those here at the canonicalization step, which is, of course, after the parsing step. And by the way, this is also what Elm does. So the reason for this is effectively that infix operators are hard, and there are a lot of complexities that we would have to deal with if we were if we were handling this portion of the process at the parsing step. We're able to skip some of those complexities in the parser itself and then go ahead and do it at canonicalization when we already have an ersatz abstract syntax tree available to us. Okay, so another thing that happens at the canonicalization step is a sort of simple recursion checking. We're going to come back a little bit to conversion later at a later step that we're going to talk about in the compilation process. So that's roughly what's happening at this canonicalization step. And you can see here in our can directory a number of the different things that are happening here. We've got annotations, built-ins, handling constraints. We'll talk about this a little bit in a second. We've got def that we looked at. We've got our environment here, and so on and so forth. So that's what's happening at the canonicalization step. The next step and the sort of final major step that we're going to talk about in the front end portion of, of comp compilation is type inference. So now we're ready to start determining the types of the stuff that we have defined within this program, right? And the way that we do this is by generating a big array of types that we index into. So uh, it's called subs. The, the big array has the name subs in the code, and that stands for substitution. It's a substitution array. So type inference for rock has two phases. The first is constraint generation, and the second is solving. So let's talk about constraint generation first. This, uh, this is where we determine what types things have to be where those types are not, where we're not, um, where we have not evaluated an explicit type for each item yet. So for example, at the constraint generation step, we're determining, well, this function takes in a string and therefore this variable that's been passed in at the point where this function has been called 
has to be a string. Now, there are a couple of different ways that one can do type inference. In particular, the procedure that Rock uses, it's most valuable to understand for the way that Rock is doing this, is called Hindley-Milner type inference. And uh, once again, I will link a video in the description to help you understand Hindley-Milner type inference if that's something that's new to you. It's this really great video from a lecture series out of Arizona State University. So that's what we're doing here is we're determining basically um, without having evaluated yet information about the explicit types given the context what do we already know about what types can be put into this portion of the program. So that's constraint generation and uh, let's look at some of the places where that's happening. Let's see if we can find and so we looked at another thing called expert, and this time we are looking in the directory structure is important here, compiler constraint source. Okay, so this is where you can see some of that code for constraint generation. Let's see where else have we got it. We've got it in constraint. .rs. Now, You'll notice that this is not in the constraint directory, it's in the can directory. So this is an example of what we were talking about before, where the location of the files don't always make semantic sense, and instead they are grouped with files where they tend to be changed with those files more often. So this is where you can look for some of that constraint generation code. Now the second step for type inference is solving, that is determining that this type is the same as that type and therefore they can be treated the same. And we can look at an example of this. Let's see. Let's look in the solve. Look at solve.rs. And this is going to be in the solve directory as you could expect. So this is where you'll find a starting point for our solving code. We use a procedure here called unification. So if you're familiar with the union find data structure, then you'll have some familiarity with the way that this is working. Now, it's worth noting that we shell out some of that union find algorithm logic. This is the kind of thing that can end up, if it's implemented incorrectly, taking a really long time. We're talking about potentially a complexity here of like big O of n squared. And so we want this, of course, to run as fast as possible. Speed really matters. And so we end up using a lot of tricks here to get this unification step to run as quickly as possible. That's the high level overview of the front end of the compiler. That is getting from the .rock file where somebody has written rock code to an abstract syntax tree with the types checked and the dependencies evaluated such that we're ready to start translating this code into something that an individual machine can do. So you can imagine now that we have effectively our intermediate representation of this code so far. And now we're going to start talking about the back end. And that starts after type inference with the monomorphization step. So let me see if I can find this directory for you. We have got the mono directory. Let me find a specific file in it so that we can look at it. Okay. So monomorphization is converting from type variables to concrete types, which uh, can result in multiple type specific implementations of something. Um, in particular of polymorphic operations. So for example, if you've got a function that can take in either a float or an integer, then monomorphization is potentially the creation of two separate implementations such that if an integer is passed in, then the integer implementation runs, and if the float implementation is passed in, then the float implementation runs. So we can look in this intermediate representation file at a couple of different things that it will be good for you to know or around. Um, the first one, 
will be, and let's see if I can find it. Okay. So we've, uh, we've got this statement enum. Now, one thing to know is that Brock is a functional language, but it still has some imperative concepts in it for ease and expressiveness. This is also, by the way, something that OCaml does. So you're going to see in here, for example, let, um, the concept of let for defining a variable. You see uh, switching. We've got a uh, switch sort of condition in here. And uh, we also have join and jump. And we'll end up using these for variable referencing as well as for tail call optimization. So tail call optimization allows for taking, for example, a recursive call, something that is recursive, and, uh, and allowing that to only use one stack frame at a time by converting it from a recursive call to an aggregating call. This is another thing where I won't go super into detail on it here, but I will link a video in the description to make that more clear if this is a concept that's brand new to you. There's another enum in here that might be valuable for you to be aware is here. Here it is. Okay, so expression, right? Now it's worth noting that expression is not recursive. It can't contain other expressions. It's effectively an array of statements. So that ends up making code generation at a later step a lot easier, but it is different from some other compiler implementations. Now, like I mentioned here at this monomorphization step is where we're taking care of tail call optimization. A couple of other things happen here. Let me make sure that I get them all with my notes here. So um, here, we also do insertion of reference count instructions. So it's worth noting the rock does not have a garbage collector. Instead, the garbage management strategy is all reference counting. So there is a paper that sort of serves as the inspiration for the way that rock handles um, the way that rock handles memory, and the paper is called Counting Immutable Beans. And effectively, what counting immutable beans talks about is the utility in a functional language of taking an exclusively reference counting approach to memory management. Now, there are a number of issues with potentially reference counting. There is some performance overhead associated with reference counting. And there is another weakness with reference counting insofar as that if you have two objects with strong references to each other, then that reference cycle can result in neither of the objects ever um, being removed from memory, even if they are not referenced anymore, except for referencing each other. So the way that Rock ends up dealing with this is it doesn't let you have variables with strong references to each other. And that's something that gets talked about in the Counting Immutable Beans paper too. So um, when I link that, if that's something that you're more interested in, then that is where you can find a little bit more on that. Now, it's worth noting that Rock also does do recursion checking at the canonicalization step, as we talked about a little bit earlier. So then uh, the other thing that is happening at the monomorphization step is the alias analysis, i.e. the morphic stuff. And so um, this is where we're proving that it is safe to do in place mutation at compile time, um, for i.e., that a uh, given type is not aliased. The implementation here is a simple idea, but uh, horrifically complicated to enact in practice. And let's see if I can find the file where we are doing this. It's called alias analysis. So, this is the file where we are doing this alias analysis. So we are using the morphic library to handle a lot of this for us. And that way we just have to define our values in an array. Um, 
the final sort of extra thing that's happening at monomorphization, the monomorphization step is checking that a pattern match is exhaustive. Now, technically, this would be part of canonicalization, but it depends on the monomorphization of types right now in this implementation, and so that's why it's happening here. So once we have done our monomorphization, the sixth and final step of the compilation process in ROC is code generation. So this is the part where we are generating the instructions that are going to be run for a specific target um, virtual machine or machine. Now, the most mature implementation that we have right now targets LLVM. So let me show that to you. Um, that is in build.rs. Um, this one, the LLVM one. So just a little bit about LLVM. This uh, is an uh, sort of... Uh, virtual machine instruction set is pretty old. It's going on 20 plus years at this point and uh, makes some assembly optimizations for you if you are targeting it from a programming language. It has a couple different tool sets for this that you can use and it serves as a sort of a general target representation for programming language front ends. Oh, Cat's knocking stuff over. Uh, <laughs> now he's scared of what he knocked over. Um, what was I saying? So LLVM, we can target it from the front end of a programming language, and it can take it allows us uh, once we've targeted LLVM to go ahead and run on a number of different machine types, and it has tool sets for optimization. So as your if you uh, get involved in compiler development, often LLVM will be one of sort of the first targets at this point. And as with ROC, it is the most sort of mature one that we have right now. Now, it's worth noting that it's not super fast for, uh, for this use case. And so there are a couple of other efforts in flight to target, for example, to go like straight to an x86 or 64 machine or uh, rather than to go through LLVM but in the meantime this LLVM target is kind of our most mature. We've also got a uh, code to target WebAssembly, uh, WebAssembly via LLVM and normal assembly. So we can ultimately be way faster than LLVM if we don't worry about optimization in the meantime and then go straight to our own assembly. That's an effort that is kind of currently in progress. But uh, let me talk a little bit more about this LLVM. So what this build.rs file is doing is it's taking every statement from the monomorphization phase. Remember that those expressions are not recursive. They essentially serve as a collection of statements. This is where that becomes valuable because we can take every statement from the mono phase and then translate it to an LLVM IR statement. So we can use like an LLVM intermediate representation command. There is a library in Rust called Inkwell that we are using to do it. It is effectively a wrapper around LLVM. You'll find these in a lot of programming languages in the event that you want to write a compiler that targets LLVM in that language. So we'll look at an example now. Let's say we were looking at exponentiation, right? So that, let's see if we can find, that's declared here, this numpal thing, right? That is implemented in num.zig. So let's go take a look at um, where can I find it? Here we go. So implemented here, and then it is linked to its types in another file called main.zig. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, here we go. 
Okay, so this is where you can find that. Now you find a lot of our uh, built-ins that use Zig for the implementation in these files here at built-ins bitcode source. So you've got num.zig here, list, hash, dict, string, and then we've got this main file where we're doing all of the linking up. Now this code generation step is sort of the portion where things about the compiler are changing the fastest. And so I suspect that this portion of the walkthrough is the part that is going to be the quickest to get out of date. So in the meantime, sort of the most important things to remember is that there are a number of different targets going on. The, I would say, LLVM is sort of our most mature right now. There's WebAssembly efforts in the works, regular assembly efforts in the works to go straight to assembly. Um, but there's a lot of implementation still to be done. So if that's something that's super interesting to you, by all means, uh, give us a shout. We would be more than happy to have your help. So those are some general starting points, and hopefully that gives you an overview of the way that the Rock compiler works, both in terms of sort of the general front-end structure and the general back-end structure, as well as what is traditional and what departs from some of the first text traditions with regard to the way that the compiler is constructed. A lot of this is likely to change in the near and intermediate future. It's still under active development and we are looking for more contributors. So if compiler development is something that speaks to you, by all means, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to answer any questions in the comments on this video. And uh, I guess that's it. I hope you learned something about maybe compilers in general, but hopefully the rock compiler specifically and heard about something interesting that maybe you'll want to check out in the description. So thanks folks. Have a great night.